Hey folks, welcome to The Artist Craft. I am your host, Stacy Cochran, and we are joined in studio today by an outstanding author. Robert Crace is the author of 16 novels, including The Monkey's Raincoat, L.A. Requiem, and Hostage, which was made into a major motion picture starring Bruce Willis. He began his career writing scripts for television shows like Hill Street Blues, Miami Vice, and L.A. Law, but made the decision to become a full-time novelist in the mid-1980s. His latest novel, The First Rule, has just been published, and he is currently on a three-week author tour to promote the book. Thank you very much, Robert, for joining us in studio today. Well, Stacy, thank you. It's great to be here. Well, I had read in the press materials for The First Rule that the, the, the catalyst for the book was an image of, of Joe Pike running through the desert with two children. What was the emotional significance of that image as a catalyst for the book? Pike is father. I mean, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a visual guy, and the books always start with an image of some kind. And when I had that particular fantasy film clip in my head, uh, what resonated for me was Joe Pike as father. And once I had that hook, I, w I had to follow it because Joe is so not the father. Do, do most of your novels, do you start with that kind of, with an image in mind and then see where the emotional connection to that image leads you? Is yeah, the, the image, maybe it's because I'm a, a visual person. Uh, that could be because of my prior film career. Mm -hmm. But there's always an image. The image, though, always has emotional content. Uh, just as the, the, the Pike and the Two Children did. Uh, it's the emotions that really hook in for me, and, and that's what I, I want to explore and follow. Fascinating. So family and the need for family is, is a central theme to, to the first rule. Uh, what did you learn about family by focusing on that for the course of a novel? I think one of, one of the realities for, for Pike and for all of us is that we want someone to love. Uh, uh, I, I guess there are classic loners who really are loners and, and, and never have anyone, but I think most of us feel some sort of deep genetic need to have another human being to love. And I thought, here's Joe Pike, who uh, through the course of the books is always alone, basically, and, and, and is a very enigmatic figure. I wanted to, s to bring him to a point where, where that need was, was triggered and we could maybe explore it a little bit and have some fun with it. Fascinating. So you've been on tour a little bit with the book so far. Has, has anything surprised you or have you been on so many book tours that, that nothing surprises you anymore? Yeah, uh, you know, there's always a surprise. I mean, you, 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 you get great feedback, but, but the, the real pleasure for me, and I'm one of the few writers I think who actually likes this. Most, most writers don't. Uh, I love meeting my fans, and I love meeting my, my readers. I think of them as my people. And, and so many of the people who come to the signings, the, you know, they're with me through the website, they're with, with me through my newsletter, and they come and we talk about those things. And it's really like meeting old friends. How did growing up in, in Louisiana inform some of your sensibilities that, that show up in your writing? Oh, great question. I, I think, well, I come from uh, a family of mostly police officers. Uh, I'm like the one who didn't become a police officer. And I think growing up in that environment uh, very likely sort of set the groundwork for me, my interest in law enforcement, my, my interest in detective fiction and, and, and cop fiction. And if I hadn't grown up in my particular family, I don't think I'd be writing this material today. Seems like an interesting career choice, though. If you've, um, you've, you've got folks in your family who mm -hmm. are police officers as sort of a model. Where, where, did, you, where did you say, okay, I want to be, be a writer. I want to go into the arts. Uh, you you, know, I you, write stories. Yeah, that, was, that, was, that didn't go over too well. Uh, I, you know, I, God bless them. They wanted me to do something normal, you know, something with a steady paycheck and, 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 and all those things that, that we, we deal with when we want to do something crazy. No one in my family had ever done anything artistic. Had, you know, no one ran off to be an actor or a filmmaker or a writer or anything. Uh, it was sort of okay to play a, you know, a banjo. That was okay, but nothing else. Sure. Uh, 
and I, my writing was actually actively discouraged. Uh, you know, my father really didn't approve. He was sort of tolerant of it a, a little bit, but as long as it was understood that this was a hobbyist's pursuit and, and, and was not to interfere with more important things like schoolwork and, and whatnot. But I got bit by the bug deep and early, and I, I knew that my passion lay with telling stories. That's what I wanted to do. At, at what age did, did you junior make high. that decision? Junior high. Early? I started making up my, my own stories in junior high. I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't writing on a typewriter, but I would write, you know, in tablets uh, and write stories. I would draw my own comic books. Uh, I, I had an old Super 8 camera, and I would make, you know, stop motion animated pictures and, and, and little little movies. Was part of your uh, intensity or, or, you know, resoluteness to make it work a response to your dad saying, well, I don't think this is what you should be doing, and why don't you get a job like you know, <laughs> the rest of us? Maybe. You know, I, I, I can't say that for certain. All I know is that I was passionately driven to create other worlds. You know, I loved reading. I loved writing, uh, uh, watching movies. I loved the, the old TV shows like Twilight Zone and, you know, Outer Limits and all, Man from Uncle and, and all these things. And I loved them so much that I, want, I think I wanted to disappear into them as a young child. And when you get older and you realize that, hey, these things are made by other men and women, you know, kind of just sort of like you, mm -hmm. then it became an obsession to want to make my own and, and tell stories like those people were telling. And you made the decision very young, at 22 or 23, to, to move to Hollywood yeah, yeah. And, and try to make a go yeah. of writing scripts and, and yeah. filmmaking. Yeah, I was It seemed 20. like that was where stuff was happening in the entertainment industry. And it was where you could make a living. You mm -hmm. remember, it, 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 because at the time, uh, first of all, I, I never entertained writing novels at, at that point because I, I knew I just didn't have novels mm -hmm. in me. Uh, but I had written a ton of short stories and I had a ton of rejections. I think it was something like 116 before I made my first sale for 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but after just two or three short fiction sales, for which I never earned more, I think, than $130. Uh, I thought, well, you know, maybe I do have a little talent. You know, may maybe I can make a go of this. So I, I left school and uh, and ran away to California to try to get into TV, and that didn't go over well either. How important was that first sale? It was only a few bucks, but that had to be you hugely, know. hugely important uh, because, you know, the whole thing about something like writing is that you never really know that you, you have any talent for it until someone pays you for it. And you take that as kind of the, 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 the titular proof mm -hmm. that you can, you can write. Now that may or may not be true, but it's what all aspiring and beginning writers believe. So when I finally got that very first sale, it was as if I were at the end of, a, 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 of an enormous marathon. Now our audience for a lot of these interviews is composed of aspiring writers, folks in the, in the writing community. Uh, can you take us back in time uh, to when you made the move to Hollywood? Sure. What was kind of going through your mind? How did you first get your foot in the door selling a script in L.A.? Um, w at the very start of that whole process, let me just tell you how I kidded myself in into doing it which is the way most people kid themselves. I made this, this promise to myself that I was only going to give it a year. So you'd like you give yourself a false time limit. Mm -hmm. And I, I know now that that, 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 was, that was actually silly. You're either a writer or, or you're not. And what I mean by that is that if you're serious about the pursuit, uh, I, I believe that you, you continue to write, you know, if you have to fashion some kind of life around it with like a real job, and you know, then, then you do it, great, and that's great, and then you you, you write. In, in my case, you know, I made that self my promise, and I uprooted, moved to Los Angeles, didn't know anyone there, I had no friends in the business, um, and I learned to write scripts by going to secondhand bookshops and, and buying old scripts, and actually measuring them on my typewriter, mm -hmm. and and reading them and then watching television with a critical eye. You know, not just watching for fun, but w watching and taking notes and breaking them down to learn exactly the dramatic beats that go into an hour of TV. Which, by the way, 
is the same way, I think, is the best way for people to learn how to write short stories or novels, too. To read, to learn. It's hmm. very true. The author is Robert Crace. The book that he is on tour for right now is The First Rule. Uh, we're talking a little bit about, I'm, tr I'm trying to follow a timeline here sure. to, to get us up to the present. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I'm really fascinated by is, is how people become writers and, and, and make oh. that decision. So, so you had moved to LA, you're studying the craft, right. really studying it intensely. Yeah. How do you get your first foot in the door? Are you reading Variety magazine? You know? uh, actually, I, I, I was reading this book, The First Rule, is dedicated to my now friend Harlan Ellison, mm -hmm. the, the great fantasist. Uh, and, and, and Harlan, uh, before I knew him, because I didn't know him then, but he was writing uh, a weekly column for the LA Free, Free Press called the Glass Teat, later collected into two volumes. Sounds like a Harlan Ellison. Doesn't it? Column. And it's perfect, too. <laughs> because Harlan at that time was a, was a working TV writer, and that's what the column was about. That's why the Glass Teat. You know, it was about television and, and the making of TV and how silly and stupid and wrong-headed and wonderful it, it can be. Mm -hmm. I lived for reading that column, and, the, and I did because it made the writing of television seem accessible to me. Remember, the underlying message was if some kid from Painesville, Ohio, Harlan, can run away and, and go to Hollywood and, and break in and write scripts and be paid for it, mm -hmm. well then why can't some kid from Baton Rouge, Louisiana do the same thing? Uh, so that great motivation from Harlan Ellison's work, I think, is probably the little push I needed. I wanted to go to LA. I wanted to write scripts because I wanted to make a living writing. And, and my scripts were going to uh, provide me the funds to write more short stories because it wouldn't matter if I only got paid $50 each and, and to finally write you know, novels or anything else I wanted, wanted to write. Hmm. Well, now you're you're known now for your crime fiction, yes. uh, for thriller fiction, uh, and your presence in the in the mystery and crime fiction community. Uh, but there there's a little story there. I'm sure you've probably been asked about before. You've got Harlan Ellison, who's a sci known as a science fiction fantasy sure. author. You attended Clarion mm -hmm. early on, which I was surprised to the learn. The science fiction writing workshop. Right. Yeah. yeah. So were you interested in in trying to be a science fiction writer at at some point, it sounds like I wanted to write anything and everything. You know, back during my uh, years of of hammering out short stories and submitting them and desperately chasing that first sale, I wasn't just writing uh, crime fiction and mystery stories, which I was writing. I was writing science fiction. I was writing uh, uh, westerns. I was writing even the occasional romance thing. I would write, thinking I, if I put a you know put a, a woman's name on it, I might, might sure. have a shot. Got rejected by everybody. But I, I, I loved science fiction, too, uh, along with, 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 with mystery fiction. And the Clarion Writing Workshop uh, was, and remains, actually, probably the premier writing workshop in America. And their graduates have uh, a, a success rate that's inordinately high. I, I, I don't know what the exact number is anymore, but on the order of 30% of the people who go through the Clarion program end up at least selling some short stories and whatnot. And quite a few go on to very, very significant careers. And you've gone back as an instructor more recently. This past summer at uh, UCSD, uh, mm -hmm. University of California, San Diego. Uh, they asked me back to be an instructor after all these years, and I, I loved it. Uh, it. It was an experience that I enjoyed when I first went through in the 70s. And uh, to go back as, a, as an instructor and work with 18 superbly gifted aspiring writers was uh, a real treat for me. The author is Robert Crace. Uh, the book that he's on tour for is The First Rule. We're talking about the formation of an outstanding New York Times bestselling author. So what would a Robert Crace science fiction novel look like? <laughs> Short. I don't know. Uh, you know what? It'd probably look a little bit like a William Gibson novel. Because if you've read uh, uh, the William Gibson cyberpunk mm -hmm. uh, novels, they're really sort of Raymond Chandler-like sure. crime pieces set in the future and in a world of cyber, uh, you know, in, in a cyber world. 
but there's a lot of elements that are very, very close to, to what Chandler was doing a long time ago. I want to read it. I know your crime fiction fans are going to be frustrated to hear that, but I would love to read. Check it out. See if moment. I'm right. Yeah. Yep. There you go. Well, so what did you learn? What did you learn, or, or better yet, a better way of phrasing the question, how, how did uh, television prepare you for, and, and writing scripts, yeah. prepare you for the life of, of being a novelist? Actually, I, I think it helped enormously. Because I actually look at, at the 10 years I spent in television as, as sort of my university education. Uh, I was a baby writer when I, when I got involved. And it was my, my great fortune that allowed me to work with some, some really gifted, terrific writers. You know, I worked on Hill Street Blues with uh, Stephen Bochco and Tony Yurkovich and, and the other writers who were there. Uh, I worked on Cagney and Lacey, uh, Miami Vice all with really seasoned pros who were, who were really, really talented. And those shows, when you think about it, they're known for their character work, their dialogue, the tightness of their plotting. Mm -hmm. uh, in Hill Street's case, in Cagney's clay case, uh, your richness of character in, in, the, in the way multi-storylines interweave and overlap and, and, and are extended for weeks at a time. Those were important lessons to, to learn. And I think I, or at least I hope, that I bring those lessons into my, uh, into my fiction today. And I think that's probably why a lot of reviewers will, for example, point out that they find my work very visual. Well, that's because the first 10 years of my life I was writing visual material. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from Bochco? What, what, how did he impress you and influence you? Uh, I, uh, Bochco's big thing was character nuance. Uh, you know, it's the small things that are the most telling. You know, the larger something is, the more out of focus it is, and the more cartoon-like it, it is. Not to say funny, but, but it, you begin to lose focus. The smaller something is, the, the, it, it becomes more nuanced, it becomes more real. And, and Stephen, if, if you watched his work, as I did when I was working with him and trying to learn from him, uh, he could be very, very telling in just a moment here or a moment there. Uh, also, by the way, the actors that I worked with you know, on, on Hill Street, Dan Trevanti and Cagney and Lacey, uh, Tyne Daly and Sharon Gless, these are all enormously talented people. And by watching them every day, watching them on the set and then in dailies, watching them, watching how they move through a scene, embellishing what's, what's written, and then you, s you end up thinking, I wish I'd written that. Or they would, they would make move in a certain way or touch something in a certain way and you think, I see why she's doing that. That's, that's adding so much. I wish I had written actually sure. that into the script. And I try to bring that with me now in, in the writing of the, the novels. What an education and making a living at it while you're doing it. Yeah, it, wasn't, it was very cool. Well, the author, again, is Robert Crace. The book that he's on tour for right now is The First Rule. It's the second to really focus on Joe Pike as yeah. a central character. Uh, so is, is Joe becoming, you know, going to be the dominant character, do you think, uh, for you? N not the way you mean. Uh, this book's a Joe Pike book. It's, as you said, number two. Uh, the book I'm writing for next year is another Joe Pike book. But not dominant as in uh, I'm not going to write Elvis Cole anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just that right now I'm having so much fun writing Joe Pike. Uh, and I feel like I'm in sort of a Pike groove, the way my head is working now is for Pike and Pike type books. You know, the Elvis books are sort of like detective novel <coughs> thrillers. Uh, the Pike books are more out and out thrillers mm -hmm. because of the difference in, in the characters. And I'm having uh, a lot of fun and, and clearly I think my readers are too. So we'll just stay with, we'll stay with what works for now. No doubt about it. Well, can you talk a little bit about making that transition from television? It sounds like you'd gotten to where it was stale or it was a bit of a grind. Yeah, I was bored by it. And so you said, yeah. I, want to, I want to step out and, yeah, and I convince will. the wife that, that you wanted to be a novelist. Hey, uh, hey, I was really lucky that way. My wife um, was super supportive. Uh, our friends all thought I was insane. Mm -hmm. you know, all the people I was working with in, mm -hmm. uh, on the various shows I was on, sure. my, my writer-producer friends, uh, thought I was absolutely gonzo out of my head because you know, the career was going well mm -hmm. and we were doing very, very well. But it was driving me crazy. Uh, I loved TV at first, but by the end, I was bored by it. Uh, I, I, I felt hampered by it, and I really wanted to get out and do my own thing. Um, the transition wasn't easy. I wrote 
two manuscripts prior to The Monkey's Raincoat, and, and both those manuscripts, in retrospect, I know they were me trying to teach myself how to write a novel. Mm -hmm. They were so bad that no other human has ever seen them. I mean, they were just awful. Uh, but third time was the charm, mm -hmm. and I uh, uh, finished The Monkey's Raincoat, and I thought I had something here, and uh, eventually we found a home for it. Very cool. Did you have in mind that you could go back to writing TV scripts if the novel thing? Yeah, didn't I, work I, out? I did. And in fact, uh, for the first several years of my book career, uh, I mean, I was getting virtually nothing for the books. Mm -hmm. You know, now the books do really well, and I'm here talking to you and whatnot. But uh, when I started with this, with the Monkey's Raincoat, I really started at the bottom of the of publishing. You know, Monkey's Raincoat was, was published as a paperback original uh, category fiction with, you know, absolutely no support, <coughs> no, no publicity, no marketing, no nothing. And if I have any success today, I think it's because of readers, you know, book by book, readers, more and more readers would read them, they would tell their friends and it would spread. But in those days, it was a negative cash flow situation and I would write a book, <coughs> pardon me, I would write a book and it, I'd be losing money while I wrote the book and then as soon as I would finish I would have to jump on some TV work to pay the bills and then write another book. Mm, well it makes sense you got to find ways to make ends meet. <laughs> got to feed the bulldog. No doubt about it. So Robert Crace is the author of The First Rule, The Monkey's Raincoat which we were just talking about just a moment ago. Uh, take us back to the day did you have an agent when you sold the monkey's raincoat? Yes, I did. Take us back to the day that you were told that the book had sold. Uh, elation and relief. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, uh, because monkey didn't sell right away, I think nine, eight, eight publishers rejected it before the ninth finally, finally bit and bought it. Uh, I felt uh, elated because I'd, I'd sold a book. Mm -hmm. um, Where were you when you found out? I, yeah, I was, in, um, I was in my house in, in, in L.A., uh, and I was, as hard as I could, I was writing some TV episodes at the time to make up for all the money that, that we had lost while I was away writing books for free um, and, you know, pay the rent. Sure. Uh, and I, I, I remember just sitting there, shocked and stunned, while the agent was still on the phone and just feeling like it finally happened. I, I, I've proven I can do it. And then I remember thinking, now I just got to figure out a way to make a living at it. Uh, but that was, it was good. It, the real surprise was when my agent said, well, they're not just buying this book. I said, what are you talking about? He said, they want two. I had never thought about writing a second Elvis Cole novel. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just trying to write one book that right. made sense. You know, and when the publisher said, well, well, they wanted more, they wanted to make it a series. Then you've got a path to follow. Yeah, you know? then, then that was... Uh, mm -hmm hey, there's a doorway open here, and uh, let's step through. And The Monkey's Raincoat went on to be nominated for just about every uh, award in okay. the crime fiction community. Yeah. Won the Anthony and the McCavity mm -hmm. Awards. Mm -hmm. uh, what do those awards mean at that point in your career? It got me a lot of attention. You know, the, uh, the Anthony and the McCavity were both fan enthusiast awards. Uh, the Anthony is given by the World Mystery Convention, the Boucher Con. Uh, and clearly, it uh, it brought Elvis Cole and Robert Crace a lot of attention that uh, they ordinarily would not have would not have had, mm -hmm. and that caused more and more people to pick up that little paperback and read it, mm -hmm. and it began the the viral process of 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 spreading the book out amongst readers. Now we shoot forward just a few books to to L.A. Requiem, which was mm -hmm. really your breakout novel. Yes, it was. Uh, how did your writing process evolve from the way you were writing when you wrote The Monkey's Raincoat to L.A. Requiem? Um, Monkey and the first few Elvis Cole books were, were pretty much written to the classic Chandlerian paradigm for a detective novel. You know, everything was point of view of Elvis Cole, the, the narrator. Uh, I never broke that point of view. And, and the books were fairly short and, and, and simply structured. You know, pretty much the classic three-act play structure. Uh, but during the course of writing the first seven, 
I really began to chafe at the rigidity of, of that structure. And also I had this guy, Joe Pike, who was riding a shotgun for Elvis. And I, be I, I became more and more obsessed with writing about Joe be because, you know, I'd begun to build his backstory. I, I knew that there was enormous dramatic potential in, in who Joe Pike was. But I could not tell that story from Elvis Cole's point of view. You know, I and the reader, we, we had to be with Joe for many of the scenes. Otherwise, it would lose so much power. So when I came to L.A. Requiem, I sort of kicked out the jams on that classic paradigm and expanded everything. There was Elvis Cole in it, first person, but there was Joe Pike in it, third person, and there were flashbacks. and multiple parallel stories. You know, it was, it was this huge, enormous suspense thriller detective conglomerate. As you were writing it, what did you think the, the reception <laughs> to that novel would be? Because you had yeah. to know that it, this is very different than what yeah. I've done. I was terrified. I, I was terrified. I actually thought at, at several points along the way that it was a, 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 a huge failure. I was scared it would end my career. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I finally finished the book and I sent it to my publisher, uh, I called my agent and I said, listen, I, I just sent it off and you know, you're going to get yours tomorrow. I was, I was so scared of that book that I thought we should voluntarily allow the, 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 the publisher to pass on it because I was, I was scared they would, they would terminate my contract. And that's, that's no bull, that's actually true. I, was, I thought it would end my career. Isn't it amazing though the thing you're, you doubt the most at that point? Yeah. Uh, turns out to yeah. be. It ended up being my, from a first New York Times bestseller. Mm. Very cool. Well, the author is Robert Crace. The book that he's on tour for right now is The First Rule. It's a second Joe Pike novel. It's outstanding. Uh, I recommend checking it out at your local bookstores uh, or online uh, as well. Well, we're coming down to our last 45 seconds or so. What advice would you give to an author who's just sold his or her first novel to a major publisher. What kinds of things do they need to be thinking about? Uh, the first thing is, is start writing another thing immediately. Uh, people tend not to. People get bogged down in the present. And when you're a writer, you always have to be generating new material. Nothing will sell your first book better than your second book. Uh, that's, that's the first thing I would absolutely tell anyone to do. Keep writing and write what you love. Well, I think we're just about out of time here today at the Artist Craft. I could probably talk with Robert for a couple of hours, but unfortunately we're limited to 28.30. Uh, I want to say thank you very much for joining us in studio today. To thank you, you Stacy. I appreciate it. It's been fun. And for all of us here at the Artist Craft, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Now go buy the first rule. Thank you very much. roll credits here. Great. Are we clear or are we still? I bet we're probably still live, but a okay. nice little chat here is you know, Great. I, I had a, I had a good time talking with you.